Hello, and welcome to Five Ways to Get the Most Out of Notifications. I'm Christine Lavoie, a Senior Client Account Manager here at IFS North America, and today we're going to walk through notifications in IFS Field Service Management, how to set them up, and then walk through five ways to use notifications to improve your user interaction with FSM. In its simplest form, a notification message is an email or SMS that tells someone something is, that has happened or is about to happen. Why do you care about notifications? Notifications give you a simple, consistent method to communicate key information in the organization automatically for customers, technicians, subcontractors, and others in your organization. They also provide a method to provide exception management on non-adherence to pricing, methods to manage your approval, to look at escalations, and to tell when you're at risk of missing a time commitment related to an SLA without having one of your team members needing to remember to send a message or communicate with someone. They automatically happen based on a series of conditions in the application. When you start your notification journey, I would encourage you not to make the most common mistake when implementing notifications. That is the case of over notification. Find the balance that works for you and your users. If you send too many emails or messages, you're going to end up in a filter folder that doesn't get read or your organization is going to become message blind and stop opening them. Well-written notification rules manage exceptions to the rule, believe in the system, and are confident things are happening, and only send notifications that don't fit normal criteria. Notifications inform interested individuals when important steps occur in your process. This information can be provided directing to the users so that you do not have to play telephone passing information messages from one user to another with things getting lost in the translation. You can send notifications for events created for the following requests, tasks, projects, product, escalation, non-part usage, contract line, and run log. Notifications are comprised of the notification message, the distribution list of who's going to get the message, and the associated business rules on in what occurrence does this notification occur. We recommend that you set up notifications for completion of asynchronous processes, like invoicing if you're running them in batch overnight, or things like inventory replenishment. Let's start at the very beginning and look at where you start your journey to implementing notifications by building the background setup. As with everything in field service management, there are a few application parameters that are going to impact your results. Let's look at those and see what's going to happen. Default email address from. This is the email address that appears as the from when you send an email message. Default subject line is the subject line on the email message coming from the notification. Log notification message will write notifications that are sent to your server logs. SMS default address and FSMS default subject line are the from and subject line for SMS messages. The first thing you're going to want to set up when you're building notifications is your notification message. A notification message is what you want to say in the notification. Notification message records are used to specify text in the notification and then in combination with the distribution list business rules, 
Notifications can be sent for tasks, requests, projects, run logs. You can use HTML to format your message. Using substitution variables, notification messages can be customized to include information such as the request ID, contact information, along with product and model information. As an example, when a request has been completed, this, this message we're looking at says that service request, request.request ID has been completed, where request.request ID indicates the request number. See the attachment for details. Thank you. And the attachment is the service report that is appropriate for your request ID that you're looking at. When you write your notification rules, to provide better information in the message, you're going to want to use variables to give the message a more contextual value to the receiver. You can create variables for address, contact, model, person, place, request, request contact, request unit, and task. These variables must exist on the request, so you cannot send a model related variable if you do not have a model identified on the request. If you are sending notifications via email, the contact or the place must have a valid email address in order for the email notification to work. You must also make sure that email is set up and interacting with your FSM server for email notifications to work. If you are using anything like time commitments, or time-based notifications, you must make sure that the service monitor is running in the background so that the processes will be successful. Now let's look at the types of variables that can exist and how you would use them. A simple variable is the field name within the table. So in this first example where I'm talking about a simple variable, I'm saying that give me the request ID from the request table. So it's just the field name with the request. If I used this variable in a notification message, it would print out the request ID. You may want to use time zones and time-related information to include information in your notification message. To do time-based notification messages, there are two functions, substitution variables, for which use time zone. The place time function is used to identify the time zone for the specified place, and the person time function is used to identify the time zone for the specified person. Each function has two arguments. The first argument is the time you want to display, the second argument is the source of the time zone information. For example, if you want to show time of a request event based on the time zone of the request owner, you specify the value indicated on the screen. Person underscore time, where my request dot request event date time is the person owner request time. The next variable we're going to look at is the description variable. The description function is used as a substitution when you want to show a code table's description instead of the code table value itself. For example, you want to indicate the description of the request priority instead of the request priority value. In this case, we're saying give me the description of request.priority. So the priority field out of the request table. If you are running multi-language and you want to show the multi-language description, in this variable, for example, I say, give me the description of request priority in French Canadian. So you can optionally include the language code to give you notifications 
in a multilingual format. If your organization uses winter Windows authentication to log into FSM, clicking a link that refers to your FSM installation automatically opens the appropriate record in FSM when the link is clicked. You must format your messaging using HTML tags like the one shown. In this example, the app server is the domain name for your application server. The primary record is the request, and clicking on the link returns a request with a specified request ID. You can obtain screen names, standard or customized, using Studio. For more information on how to set up um, variables, you can look at the reference guide, which gives you additional examples and values. If you want to use a variable that is not defined on the t entity or the table you're looking at, you can use a substitution map. So, substitution maps are used to define the relationship between the tables to derive the substitution variable that can be used to create the notifications. There are two types of substitutions that can be created. Address information, which is used to define the recipient's of the notifications address and message body information, which is used to create personalized messages. Notifications are based on events. When the event is created, FSM can reference the information related to the type of event. For example, creating a request event information directly relates to the request available. However, other information such as request, task, project, or person is not immediately available. A substitution map from the information is available, such as the request ID and the request event, to inform not directly available, such as the person's email address. By following the substitution map, FSM can determine the desired information. The substitution map can have one relationship or many relationships. For substitution maps with many relationships, the relationships followed in sequence to arrive at the desired information by reading through them one sequence at a time. When you create a substitution map, you work from the information you know to the information you want to know or have available in your notification message. For example, if you want to send a notification based on a task event and you want the notification to include the model, you want to create a map that does the following. Based on task event, determine task ID. Based on task ID, determine product ID associated with the task. Based on product ID, determine the model associated to the product. Each substitution map requires one or more constraints. The constraints determine which record is used. Generally, only one constraint is necessary because the information used to select the record is the key value. In the example above, the task ID is the key value on which the task event table. If you want to select records without using a key value, you must specify enough constraints such that only one record can be returned based on your query of constraints. FSM has the, ability, the flexibility to create multiple substitution maps based on the values in the columns specified as constraints. You can specify a related constant for any column used in the map, and the substitution map is only available and valid when the related constant appears in the specified column. For more information using related constants, look at the reference guide. Many substitution maps return information based directly from the map. For example, a substitution map may return an address based on a map from the request event to a request to an address ID. You may, however, want to return other information, such as the email address of the person who owns the request. By specifying the column to select, you return the information you need, even if it is not the key value on the table. For example, using the map we've been discussing, you can read derive the email address for the person who owns a request. Based on the person ID who owns the request, you can determine the person ID. Based on the person ID determines the email address. 
we have predefined some substitution maps for you to use in the default application. You can also create your own. If you want to include a report with your email notification, the report must exist within FSM. You can include FSM reports as a PDF, a Word document, or Excel as an attachment to your notification message. Report parameters are specified using the parameter and value pairs. You can use substitution variables as parameter values as described above. In this example we're looking at on the screen, you will see that I'm going to send the service report. And the service report I'm going to send is based on the request ID, which is based on the request.request .request ID value. So it's going to feed the request ID into the service report as a parameter and attach it in the notification message. Once you've identified what you want to say in your message, you want to identify who you want to send the message to. Distribution list records are used to identify recipients for notifications. In combination with notification messages and business rules, notifications can be sent for tasks, requests, project, and run log events. You can specify whether a recipient is primary, the email to, secondary, the email CC, or not visible at all to other recipients, email BCC. A distribution list record can contain a reference to one specific person record, a contact record, an email address for a person who is not otherwise defined in FSM. You can also use substitution maps to customize distribution lists to include people on other records such as requests, tasks, or teams. Now that you have a notification message and a distribution list, so you have the message you're sending and who you're sending it to, you will want to use them to drive what happens on various types of notifications. There is a business rule for each entity that has events. Let's start with requests. Business rule seven creates notifications based on request events. Rules are evaluated after specified information is inserted into the database and all the rules are evaluated for all the matching return values. The input parameter is an event type of request event. You can also specify some request related information. The output parameter are a distribution list and a message name. We recommend when you're setting up your system that you create a notification that allows a notify event, which means I manually want to send a message about this request, we also recommend that you create a notification for requests that are not closed within a certain period of time using the service monitor time commitments to measure that. And we recommend that you create a notification for unusual events such as requests being reopened. When you're looking to send task-based notifications, you will want to use business rule number eight. This process creates a notification based on task events. Rules are evaluated after specified information is inserted on the database and all rules are evaluated with all matching values returned. The input parameter is an event type of task event. You can also specify some task related information. The output parameters are distribution list and message name. We recommend that you set up notification messages related to tasks for the creating notifications for field service representatives when a task has been assigned or reassigned, and that you create notifications for appropriate stakeholders such as third-party repair or management if you're sending, for example, an RMA to a third-party repair organization. You can also create notifications for unusual events such as a closed task being reopened. Next, we move on to Business Rule 33. This process creates notifications based on project events. 
Rules are evaluated after specified information is inserted on the database, and all the rules are evaluated with all the matching values returned. The input parameter is an event type of project event. The output parameter are distribution list IDs and message name. We recommend the following when setting up the rules. Create notifications for management of owner or team changes and to create notification for project action changes, such as projects is ready for review or fails quality assurance. You may also want to consider to create notifications for projects that are not closed within a certain period of time. Anything that you're using to monitor time, again, you need to set up the service monitor feature. Business Rule 42 creates notifications based on run log. Rules are evaluated after an insert or update on the run log, and all the rules are evaluated with all the matching values returned. Any run log information can be an input parameter. The output parameter is a distribution list ID and a message name. We recommend the following when setting up this rule. We recommend that you use run type and run status as input parameters to create notifications. These values are defined in the FSM code table so you can see your choices. We recommend you create notifications for long running processes to remind users to check data after completion. For example, after inputting large quantities of data into a T-table. We recommend creating notifications for processes that interface to external systems to remind users to check data on the external system. We also remind you, would encourage you to create notifications when processes finish with an unusual status or do not complete within a specified time. Do not send notifications for general reoccurring processes like task or ECO generation. Only send messages for the exception to the rule. Next, we're going to look at Business Rule 78. Business Rule 78 creates notifications based on product events. Rules are evaluated after the specified information is inserted on the database and all the rules are evaluated and matched and returned. The input parameter for Business Rule 78 is product event. The output parameters again are distribution list and message name and we'd recommend that you could set up a notification rule on product if the product status changes or if the product location changes. Business Rule 89 creates notifications based on the escalation events. Rules are evaluated after the specified information is inserted. All the rules are evaluated with matching return values and returned. The input parameter is an event type of a project event. The output parameter is the distribution ID and the message name. We recommend that you create um, notification messages for the creation of an escalation, so whoever's responsible for that escalation deals with it, and to create notifications for escalations that are not approved or rejected within a specified time period so things don't linger in the system. The last business rule we're going to talk about is Business Rule 117. This process adds contract lines to the event history. Rules are evaluated after the specified information and inserted into the contract line notification table. You can specify the information on the contract line as an input parameter. The output parameter is an event history record. Now that we understand what a business rule is and how to set them up, let's look at the top five ways to use business rules to improve your business flow within IFS Field Service Management. So, the top five ways to use notifications. One of the most common ways to use notifications is technician updates. If you are using mobile, and that is one of the ways that your technicians receive updates. Mobile has an entry-level screen that has a notification, 
and that notification is driven by those application parameters. Common technician notifications are things like stop by to pick up a part need for an emergency brake fix, um, escalating an emergency call or high priority call, important changes to schedules, and notifications via the mobile application. Notifications do not have to only be within your organization. You can have, also have customer-facing notifications. You can automatically provide updates to your customers by using notifications to confirm a request has been received, is being looked at, if the customer is using the customer portal and wants a confirmation you know about it, to advise when a technician has been assigned, when a technician is en route or arrived at a customer site, to send a written quotation, you could attach the quote to a notification generated by a quote, or you can send a service report or invoice after a visit. Notifications are also a very useful control for internal things that don't happen as expected. The mobile air log, you could create a no notification based on certain types of errors, or you could create an air log for an atypical run. You can use notifications for escalations and approvals. You do not want to create notifications for processes that run on a reoccurring basis like PMs or ECOs, or your team will become blind to them. But rem and remember that it's all about balance. You know, send notifications on the exception, not the rule. If you are using subcontractors, notifications are a handy way to send information to your subcontractor about an assignment or changes to the request or task from a priority, status, or reminder that they haven't entered their labor usage parts consumption. And the fifth reason why you want to look at using notifications is internal communication. Notifications give you the ability to have reoccurring automatic communications for exceptions where somebody doesn't have to remember to do something. You don't have to play the telephone game where someone took the call someone dealt with the call in dispatch, someone dealt with the call in a level two tech support situation, then it went to the technician, who owns the call, who's responsible for the next update. You can have notifications based on events drive all of those communications. Notifications and internal message provides a consistent type of messaging system for key at factors like a system down high priority or key customer scenarios. Notifications are a powerful tool with enough FSM to manage your business as long as you remember to find that balance and not create an ignore state. I appreciate you spending the time with me on how to discuss notifications and how they can help your business. Now, let's go into the application and take a look at what this setup looks like within FSM. When I come into the application, I have a place and I've added myself, my email address, as a contact so that we'll see it come through to myself. I've built a notification message called request space notify that says hello. This is a service request number and we should see the request ID populate in the message. and. It says it was open, the problem couldn't be resolved, and a dispatch the proper team is needed. The call is for place name. So when we get the email, um, we should see both the request ID and the place name populated. Now my distribution list is built as I'm sending to the request contact. I'm using a wildcard variable. I could have forced it to a particular person ID email. 
But in this case, I've chosen the variable request contact and I'm sending it to the recipient to primary. From there, if I look at my business rule, for business rule number seven, when my request type equals notify, send to the distribution list of request contact with the message request notify. We just looked at all of those. So if from here I go and create a new request and somebody calls me for an issue, my system's broken, hey, this is a high priority issue, and I have my customer who called me and, you know, hey, I'm getting a system error, send help. And I select my contact. And I could, this could just be a request contact. It doesn't have to be a contact in the system. Um, you're going to see that when I create the request, I get my first event. But in this case, I'm going to say, hey, I want to notify somebody immediately. And so I created that notify based on the notification event. So I added to my system an event called notification. And when I hit save here, you'll see that I now have a notification of that. Now, for those of you that are like me, if you want to make sure your stuff is going through right, you know, if you come over here to your notification log, I can come back here and do a search. And I'll see that at 531 now, I just created my notification event. And I can see that my request ID was populated. I see that my um, call for error was populated. And you'll see down here on the lower corner of my screen that we got an email for this request, you know, with the email address, my default notification, and the message that we were expecting. So notifications give you a really powerful rule to look at what's going on in the application. So I hope you will consider setting notifications up within FSM. You know, um, I'd encourage you to look at what's needed, set it up for exceptions. We, as long as we're staying in the lockdown due to um, health concerns, um, I'm not out and about traveling. So the established base team is going to be doing webinars at least through June. So if you have a topic you'd like us to cover, please feel free to email me at christine.lavoy at ifs.com. Um, I'm always looking for topics. Next week, we're going to look at best practices for building lobbies. Um, we always highlight, you know, what webinars get created in the newsletter. If you're not getting the newsletter for FSM, please let me know. And this and any of the recorded webinars are always available on the webcast channel. Again, that shows up in the newsletter. Um, it's IFS FSM webcasts. Please feel free to share it with anybody else that you think would find it useful. And I want to thank you for spending your time with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you and have a nice day.